my privilege to welcome you all for this program today as you know we are having a very good talk by one of the leading marine scientist of the country professor uh, chandrasekhar rivonkar who happens to be one of my close friend also and uh, he is not only professor of uh, marine science he is also holding the charge of uh, uh, human resource development center as a director and uh, today we will be going to speak on uh, marine seaweeds as a potential source for human nutrition and uh, officially uh, professor borse will be introducing him formally uh, professor borse will be introducing him so welcome to all the members and uh, i pass it on to professor borse sir professor borse sir namaskar yes sir am i audible yes sir please go ahead yes fine ab uh, today is the second leaf a second event that we are having under the series that we started last week interestingly today is a special day because it's the world population day and the world is facing shortage of food while of course we have been talking continuously about the covid let us keep it little aside and talk about other problems and thus the population which is so large and needs to be supported with the basics of the food shelter etc we have chosen a wonderful topic here today and the person who is going to talk about is none other than an expert in the field professor chandrashekhar rivankar as professor pai has already said that he is a professor at the school of earth science ocean and atmospheric sciences and also he is a director of human resource development center of goa university which was in the earlier called as academic staff colleges such a clear with that term he holds a phd in aquaculture he has a long experience in research he has completed already seven research projects and the both in terms of the infrastructure that he developed is of almost 2.5 crores he has 55 research papers to his credit in very very reputed journals national and international he has contributed a chapter in a book he has guided successfully five students for their phd and current two of them are almost to be submitting soon a well known speaker and has present or has presented the research papers as well as the other discourses at more than 28 international and national uh, seminars he is reviewer of several national and international research journals in 2001 he was awarded 
outstanding young personality involved and he is also involved in several other activities such as is member of board of studies member of academic council member of uh, the board of evaluation and several state level committees including which are more or less uh, all of them are related to um, environment conservation monitoring etc is an is expert on in and he a special scientific and technical of government of india devankar sir we are very devankar sir yeah good afternoon and uh, i hope i am audible right i yes, was yes sir okay. yes sir loud and clear loud and clear uh so i will i i must thank all the organizers especially professor swasek to godse and professor uh, ike pai for inviting me on this particular platform to deliver a talk today and at the outset i would also like to appreciate the efforts which have been put up by the organizers in conducting such webinars so that dissemination uh, across the nation i also understand that uh, we have today a lot of viewers from from diversified field so if it essentially started by talk in the initial stages i am going to give a brief background as far as the marine ecosystem mainly from the point of view of biological product to function and thereafter in the second half a brief uh, uh, essence of microalgae and the blue economy as as uh, it is one of the essential need at the hour and why at all we should look at the uh, uh, blue economy or the diversification of the resource production and the second part i will be talking mainly on the macroalgae or the its diversity production and maybe the farming status potential and applications etc and finally to terminate i will put forth some of the challenges which are likely to be faced in this particular sector to start with uh, marine ecosystems or the marine habitats are basically being comprised of uh, oceanic ecosystems or and uh, coastal ecosystems which uh, which are which are which occupy a comparatively larger area in terms of uh, its, uh, its its occurrence on the planet and if you look at the open oceanic ecosystem beyond a depth of about 1000 meters about 66% of the world ocean is comprised of this particular ecosystem and coupled with this uh, studies which are basically being conducted on the open oceanic ecosystems are quite limited because of uh, its a capital investment and also because of the other problems that are likely to occur although india has its indian indian antarctic program which is the, which is mainly providing some of the data and reporting mainly from antarctic or polar waters and southern ocean whereas in contrast uh, the other ecosystem which we have is the coastal ecosystem where where uh, we have a comparatively much better understanding and knowledge as far as data and other processes are concerned and secondly most of these coastal ecosystems they are considered to be comparatively dynamic because of the lot of input and the human interference that is like it offer from the land ecosystem thirdly uh, most of these coastal ecosystems are highly productive because of the processes that are that are known to be uh, uh, known to be existing in this particular environment and almost contribute to about 80 to 85% of the total productivity of the globe so if you look at our captive fishery production which is likely to be sustained at the global level we will find that it is about 80 to 85% of it is mainly being generated by the by the coastal ecosystems and therefore today our main my main focus will be to concentrate on the coastal ecosystems and the productivity that is known to offer in this particular environment which which is ultimately of benefit as far as the human mankind is concerned now if you look at the marine productivity it is ultimately what is very important is the primary productivity which is generated at the ecotic level or ecotic zone which are normally considered to be illuminated waters in the topmost layer of the ocean 
the sequestering of carbon dioxide that is likely to come from the atmosphere is not known to occur at that particular zone where a large group of these phytoplankton communities are normally known to sequester this carbon dioxide and assimilate in the form of organic carbon. So, if you look at the aquatic ecosystem uh, uh, as compared to the terrestrial environment or land, as we have plants, the aquatic ecosystem we have phytoplankton community because which is one of the main uh, driving force as far as synthesis of organic matter is concerned, and subsequently it is known to support uh, a higher up food chain in the aquatic ecosystem, and that is why that is how. We, we lead to a harnessing of these economically important resources from the aquatic ecosystem. Now, on the contrary, we also have a benthic ecosystem or a sediment watering, water interface where we have also a productivity that is basically being mediated by a detritus based food chain where some of the benthic communities are involved. Along with that, you also find a microbial population that is known to play a very important role uh, as far as the total productivity is concerned. Now, in the aquatic ecosystem or in the marine environment, you will find uh, that it is a three-dimensional ecosystem and the depth is one of the most important factors. So, in the, in, the, in the coastal waters where the depth is comparatively shallow, you will find that this, both these uh, food chains which are being propagated, one at the, at the surface level, which is mainly being mediated by the phytoplankton, and second at the benthic level or at the sediment water interface mediated by microbial population and some of the invertebrate communities like grinders or shredders, they also contribute to this particular productivity and probably that is another reason why you basically find these coastal waters to be comparatively more productive uh, as compared to that of the open oceanic ecosystems. So among these phytoplankton the communities, if you look at, you have diatoms and dinoflagellates which are one of the major groups among these phytoplankton, which contribute almost to, a, to, the, to about 90% of the total phytoplankton communities of the marine habitats. Among these, diatoms are normally considered to be important as a source of food because this group of communities are being consumed by a variety of herbivores and then you are, they are also being grazed by different groups of organisms in the aquatic ecosystem. And as a result, you find the energy which is being assimilated from this particular diatom is being passed on to a higher trophic level to sustain much of the fish and other communities in the aquatic ecosystem. So this is what you find when you talk about a phytoplankton-based food chain, where you have light and nutrient supply occurring at the surface of the water, where there is, these are illuminated waters, and thereby much of the organic matter that is known to be produced, you will find it will ultimately support a pelagic fishery that is known to prevail in that particular area. In contrast, as I said about the detritus based food chain at the sediment water interface, we have a large number of marine invertebrates, mainly represented by some of the benthic communities like uh, polychaetes or nematodes, which are known to be uh, performing a function of, uh, of grinder or shredders. And these are basically being coupled with the bi microbial biota or microbial community in that particular area. And, 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 and they, they play a very important, important role. In the mineralization of nutrients that is known to occur in that particular ecosystem. Apart from this, this bacterial population or the microbial communities also add to a substantial amount of uh, bacterial protoplasm that also enhances the nutritive value in terms of the organic matter that is synthesized in such type of ecosystems. And as a result, you will find in the deeper waters or maybe in the, in the, in the deeper waters uh, that the detritus based food chain is known to be more prevalent and supports something what is called as a immersive fishery resources. Now, as I said at some point of time, that depth is one of the important criteria as far as marine ecosystem or marine environment is concerned. And as I said, that we are mainly going to focus upon the coastal ecosystems. So most of these waters are completely shallow and they are illuminated. That means light is not a constraint. As long as nutrients are coming into this particular ecosystem, you will find that there is an assimilation of organic carbon that is known to occur. So in these shallow waters, as the depth is comparatively less, you find there is a coupling of both these food chains that is known to occur. That is one which is mediated by phytoplankton at the surface and another one which is basically mediated by uh, the, at the sediment water interface by the detritus based food chain. So both the, uh, in the shallow water, as the depth is comparatively less, you will find the coupling of these particular food chains which are normally known to occur and as a result you will find something what is called as uh, new production as well as regenerated production that is known to occur. 
the new production is normally defined as that particular production which is basically coming or produced in the marine habitats when there is the influx of new nutrient mainly coming from bleaching of earth's crust like chemical weathering or the runoff that is known to occur in the coastal ecosystems the probability of such runoff which is likely to occur in the open oceanic ecosystem is quite limited or is going to be comparatively less as the distance from the land is going on is, is increasing when you move towards the open oceanic ecosystem so as a result uh, what you find is that in the coastal ecosystems because the depth that is comparatively less you find mixing of this particular water bodies that are not formed whereas in contrast when we talk about the regenerated nutrient the regenerated productivity it is basically the nutrients which are mainly being remineralized by the bacterial fauna and fauna which is normally known to be there in that particular depth so essentially looking at this particular phenomena you will find the regenerated nutrients are not going to add to the net productivity of the ecosystem but it will only sustain that particular productivity so in the most of the open oceanic ecosystem you will find much of the productivity is basically coming from the regenerated nutrients a probable reason why the open oceanic ecosystem are comparatively less productive as compared to that of the uh, coastal ecosystems another important group that you have as far as microalgae is concerned is dinoflagellate which are basically being represented by peridinium ceratium and maybe noctiluca and a variety of groups but this particular group although it is likely to exist in the marine ecosystem is not of much use as far as the propagation of food chain or supporting of different flora and fauna in this particular ecosystems are concerned but in fact they are uh, when whenever they start blooming or when they form a bloom bloom that is known to pop you they, they you will find they are likely to have a nuisance value and great nuisance such as formation of algal blooms which not only are blooms which not only lead to discoloration of the water as you can see here but they also produce a variety of toxins and uh, and also have other detrimental impact on the water quality which ultimately results into the into the uh, alterations as far as such habitats are concerned thereby affecting the coastal faunal diversity and density that is known to prevail in this particular habitats another important group which also has got an ability of uh, forming this particular bloom is trichodesma which is which is also being reported from the indian waters and uh, as a bloom formation is likely to occur you will find that it will normally occupy a topmost layer and much of the radiant energy that is likely to come into the system is being trapped by this particular bloom so as a result what you find is that the topmost layers becomes comparatively hot or comparatively warm warmer whereas the top, bottom water remains cooler and as a result you find a water stratification that is normally known to be developed the moment the water stratification develops you will find in the deeper waters or in the intermediate waters there is a depletion of oxygen which is known to occur as there is a depletion of oxygen there is a release of phosphate from the sediments and this phosphate which is released in the, from the sediments will enter into the, it will get solubilized in the water column and over a period of time you will find this bloom will collapse or the cell lysis is normally known to take place as the cell lysis takes place there will be decomposition of this particular material leading to mainly through oxidation process and that will lead to depletion of oxygen or something what is called as hypoxic condition in the marine ecosystems and which will ultimately have an impact on on the fish mortality mainly through asphyxiation or maybe the toxins which are basically being affecting the physiology and metabolism of this particular organisms Uh, now this is another important uh, uh, component which i would like to emphasize because uh, uh, mainly with regard to synthesis and the transfer of organic matter that was not known to be there in the aquatic ecosystem now if you look at the, our understanding as far as the synthesis of organic matter in the aquatic ecosystem is concerned maybe a decade back we we did in decade or maybe 10 to 15 years back we always believed that it is the phytoplankton community which is known to play a very important role in terms of assimilation of organic carbon is concerned but over a period of time with some of the recent uh, innovative studies which have been published in recent times you will find that it is not the phytoplankton but coupled with phytoplankton there are also microbial community and bacteria which is involved in the sequestering of this particular carbon dioxide and in fact some of the recent reports which have been published claim that about 50% of the organic matter which is being fixed in the aquatic ecosystem is mainly by bacteria so uh, it, it it gives a very clear picture that bacteria also play a very important role as far as the synthesis of organic matter is concerned another important uh, uh, 
uh, issue that is associated with this phytoplankton is that they normally exude a substantial amount of dissolved organic matter. And this dissolved organic matter, which is there in the aquatic ecosystem, is accounting for about 40% of the total organic matter. And therefore, uh, the dissolved organic matter, which is exudated by this phytoplankton cells through the biological activity, uh, is going to be comprised by mainly the high molecular weight compounds that are highly volatile, like amino acids or maybe some of the fatty, fatty acids and even some of the proteins, and which cannot be easily assimilated by higher up in the organ, higher up higher organisms in that aquatic ecosystem. And that is it is here where the bacteria is normally going to play a very important role. Now the role of bacteria becomes very important because this dissolved organic matter, because of its nature, does not remain in that particular state for a substantial amount of time. It can remain for a very short span of time. And secondly, it is also comparatively known to have a very small size, about 0 .4, less than 0.45 microns. So the filtering of these particles by higher up organisms may not be a viable option in terms of the energy uh, balance that is known to be derived or benefits that are known to be derived by this particular organism. So it is here where the bacteria is known to play a very important role, which assimilates that particular dissolved organic matter, and then it is being this bacteria is being consumed by some of the marine invertebrates of group of, of, of protozoa or maybe ciliates, which assimilate this particular bacteria and then they add to the orthodox food chain, mainly through food chain or maybe the fishes. So this uh, this formation of microbial loop and the role of bacteria which is being played in the marine ecosystem becomes a synergist as far as the orthodox type of food chain is concerned. Another important thing also I would like to make to mention here is because the aquatic ecosystem is also considered to be a carbon sink. So as you find this organic matter that is basically being formed in the water column, either it has to be utilized or if it is not being utilized within that particular stipulated time in that particular uh, water column, you will find sinking of this particular organic matter that is known to offer. Under the influence of colloidal property of this particular water, you will find the aggregates that are basically being formed. These colloidal particles, they normally tend to come close to each other and form larger aggregates. And moment the aggregates are basically being formed, you will find sinking of this particular organic particle into the deeper waters, thereby oceans are considered to be one of the most important uh, uh, basin as far as the sink for carbon, uh, carbon is concerned. So these are some of the processes which will, which will take account of the, of the regulation and the modalities that are being involved as far as the transfer of organic matter in this type of ecosystems are concerned. Yeah, now coming to blue economy, yeah, by at all we should look at the aquatic ecosystem or the marine environment. And as, as most of you must be aware that our Honorable Prime Minister, uh, Narendra Modi ji has already emphasized the need of the ocean studies and uh, the purpose as far as harnessing the benefits out of this aquatic ecosystem is concerned. And these are some of the mechanisms which you will see that they have water potential in terms of ocean energy is concerned. We have wind, tides, and we have uh, one of the best examples of tourism, maybe Goa, I need not talk much about this, but another important area which is going to be uh, associated with this blue economy is aquaculture, which is going to be the focus as far as this presentation is concerned. Now, if you look at the aquatic productivity or the marine production, uh, we are today, as per FAO 2020 report, today we have a total production of the, at a global scale, somewhere about uh, 178.5 metric tons, million tons, sorry, million tons. So out of this, uh, the aquaculture production today is likely to account for about 96.1 million tons. Whereas the capture fishery is going to comprise about 84.4 million tons. So if you look at this particular scenario, you will find that, of course, there are a large number of problems in the capture fishery. I will not try to emphasize them. But the aquaculture production, which is likely to be there, is gaining momentum. And we find that it has increased over the over past decade to a large, to a, to a significant effect. And, uh, and maybe China uh, contributing to about, uh, to a major share that is about 50 million tons as far as total total aquaculture production in the world is concerned. At one point of time, the capture fishery was considered to be one of the potential uh, source as far as exploitation is concerned. But now we find that we are restored to the problems like over exploitation, stock depletion, and 
there are too many issues which are basically being associated with the fishing fishing sector as far as the fishing industry is concerned and therefore uh, looking at this you will find aquaculture to be one of the potential diversification of the resource that can be done and among this aquaculture you will find the seaweed cultivation or the macroalgal cultivation that is likely to be there is of significant importance because uh, these seaweeds are normally known to trap the solar energy and the nutrients that are available in the aquatic ecosystem and there are a large number of advantages when you look at the seaweed cultivation technology that has emerged over a period of time i'll, I'll come to that later later today now why is this blue economy so you if you look at this particular uh, scenario the, we, we cannot run away from aquatic ecosystems or the marine environment because here you will find that it has got a large number of uh, utilities in terms of the resource production is concerned apart from nutrition then sustainable use and and also uh, uh, various issues that are basically being faced today from the environmental point of view can be easily taken care in terms of sustainable development or environmental sustainability or even the utility of this particular environment or habitats and that will also have a repercussion on the improvement of the livelihood and poverty elevation that is going to occur in the in the nation uh, apart from this, the blue economy is also going to help as far as GDP or the economic growth is concerned. And moreover, if you look at the aquatic ecosystem, they are basically being considered as a buffer. So the intensity of the adaptation that is being uh, that is being shown in such type of habitats is much much larger as compared to terrestrial or land-based ecosystems. Yeah, another important thing is why at all we should look at the uh, aquatic ecosystem. As, as uh, Professor Godse has rightly pointed out that today is the World Population Day, we have a total population today somewhere about 7.8 billion uh, billions in the world. And out of this, about 1.38 is being India. And if you look at this particular uh, slide, you will find that there is a there is an exponential increase which is going to occur as far as the world population is concerned. And one of the most important criteria that is that we are, or problem that we are facing is the food security. If you look at the agriculture and most of the crops that are being cultivated from the agriculture sector, this particular slide will show you that if you look at most of the uh, uh, terrestrial or the agriculture products, they have almost obtained a upper ceiling or a stagnation towards the towards the later later situation or later later period. And therefore, the Indian agriculture as such is facing major challenges and the risk that are normally known to be there. And it it, it also gives a sufficient scope to believe that if we if we if we con, uh, confine ourselves to this agriculture production or to this type of production which mainly being coming from the land-based ecosystem it may not it may not suffice us to meet the global food, food demand as far as the global population increasing global population is concerned now yeah coming down to the marine macroalgae or the marine uh, algal population uh, we have different type of algae that are known to occur, and one of, these are the three major economically important algae, mainly the green algae, which are normally known to have chlorophyll A and B, which, is, which marks other pigment, and therefore you find a bright green color that is being attributed to this particular uh, algae. Whereas red algae is known to have a protein-based pigments, phycocyanin or phycoerythrin or phycobilins, which are largely responsible for this red color imparting, imparting red color to this particular algae. And whereas brown algae, you find phycoxanthin and xanthophyll that are normally known to mask the chlorophyll other pigments. And these brown algae are also known to have something what is called as Freudian starch, which is mainly being dominated by, by glaucons and glycophytes, which also have a large number of nutraceutical properties. I'll come to that maybe at a later stage. So these are some of the potential economically important seaweeds or macroalgae which have got uh, utilization as far as the human consumption or human diet is concerned. Now, if you look at the global macroalgae diversity that is being reported from the world, you find there are about more than 10,000 species which are being reported. Out of this, Chlorophyta, we have around 1,500 species. Rhodophyta, 6,500 species are reported and geophyta there are about 1800 species that are reported from the world ecosystems among this india has got uh, about has got about 840 species that are reported from this particular uh, indian habitats from this about 434 are red alga 216 are green 
and and one night before our crown algae that are known to occur as far as the indian uh, indian scenario is concerned now if you look at the global sea production that is known to occur you will find about six, more than 60% of the production is likely to come from red and brown algae that are affected by laminaria and ukemia apart from this you have gastleria porphyra epiphytes and sargassum which are also being cultivated and harvested in different parts of the world and they also contribute marginally to the uh, to the total cb production that is going to be generated look at the global production as per fao statistics 2020 it was estimated to be about, about 32.4 million tons as a wet weight which has almost a value of about 11.7 billion us dollars now if you look at the seaweed farming that is going to be practiced in the in the different parts of the world you will see here that there is a red zone mainly the asian sector right from indonesia japan and maybe china and even even uh, you find that the korea is also going to be associated with the seaweed farming where out of this total production that is being generated worldwide about 97.4% of the production is mainly coming from this particular ecosystem whereas on the contrary you will find tanzania coast is also involved which is basically being indicated here in the green color is also involved with the seaweed farming and the seaweed cultivation and you will find a chilly coast which also has engaged some of the seaweed technology practices and they have been farming or cultivating the seaweeds as far as the global population is concerned now the other region which you only see here on this world uh, map is the alo region which is which has which is the potential suitable site as far as seaweed cultivation or farming is concerned and as you can see there are vast areas which are available worldwide as far as uh, as far as venturing into this particular seaweed farming is concerned and uh, we we probably need a uh, sufficient efforts and more uh, awareness as far as utilizing this the resources in terms of aquaculture production which probably would suffice a large requirement uh, in terms of the food security in this uh, of the globe is concerned now obviously why why seaweeds the seaweeds uh, from the environmental point of view you will find that it is a low input practice short crop cycle maybe about 40 to 45 days does not require land and fresh water or maybe fertilizers and pesticides as compared to that of the land based agriculture systems it also acts as a natural carbon sink and not only sequesters substantial amount of carbon dioxide but the rate of it has it has it is it has although it has got a completely higher rate of sequestering carbon dioxide uh, as compared to the other uh, plant communities but it also helps in mitigating the methane emission which is not to be uh, done by the cattle by supplementing this particular algae in the cattle feed thirdly it also removes a substantial amount of toxins from the ocean and probably it guards our coastal oceans or coastal ecosystem by absorbing much of the nitrogen and phosphorus which may be known to be coming mainly from the runoff maybe from agriculture farms or other anthropogenic inputs based on the human interference and the language pattern that is known to occur so here you can see that one ton of seaweed if you are in a position to produce it can mitigate climate change by by taking care of about 120 kg of carbon dioxide 2 kg of nitrogen which pro and 0.2 kg of phosphorus and when you try to utilize this particular resources from the fish cultivation or the aquaculture this is you will also find it will not only maintain the water quality i will come to that in slightly more detail at a later stage but it will also uh, improve the fish production that is likely to be generated in that particular ecosystem then from the economic point of view you don't need much diversification of the resources to be done if you look at the coastal ecosystem as i have already indicated in that particular world map we have coastal waters with the sandy areas accounting to about 1.46 million hectares along the coast of india so the availability of land, uh, uh, suitable sites as far as such cultivation practices are concerned is not an issue as far as india is concerned with the coastline of with a huge coastline of about 7500 kilometers secondly it would create uh, employment the simple technology low capital requirement and as i told you that they have got a very short crop cycle with which will probably involve uh, uh, generating huge amount of economic economic opportunities in this particular sector and uh, as as you will see in the course of my presentation it has got also very wide applications across the industries 
uh, bio packaging order or maybe biofuel or maybe even the superfoods or nutraceutical applications as far as utility of this particular uh, material in the in the human diet is concerned and definitely it will as a result of all this it will definitely contribute as a potential source to the national gdp of the country and finally coming to the societal uh, implications you will find that it is an excellent food source because it contains abundant amount of essential proteins vitamins minerals and some of the micronutrients like iron and even the iodine it has got it is also a sustainable alternate protein that is uh, most of us are mainly looking at aquatic ecosystem or the aquatic uh, fishery resources as an alternate cheap good quality protein resource but this also is known to be equally good in terms of the in terms of the quality of the protein that is basically being generated as compared to that of the animal based protein and uh, and as we are mainly dealing with the the seaweed cultivation or the autotrophic production that is likely to occur it will have a minimal environmental footprints as far as the environmental pollution or the concern and, and it will not it does not also require a huge amount of land or food or energy and water resources now although we may not realize the importance of this particular uh, resource at this point of time but at a time when the drought and soil, soil conditions are likely to be worsen or maybe that the need for alternate process, uh, protein source to, to feed india's growing population will become increase, increasingly pertinent and challenging so at that particular point of time we are likely to face a major issue of food security as far as the global population is concerned now coming to india if you look at the indian scenario as far as seaweed cultivation is concerned Well, no much progress has been done apart from uh, gujarat and tamil nadu and maybe the lakshadweep island where there are large large scale cultivation of the seaweed practices that are basically being carried out although you will find some of the natural uh, occurring uh, seaweeds which are also known to occur along the coast of goa karnataka and kerala similarly along the east coast of india from kp and odisha but these are the two major states where you will find the last scale cultivation of this uh, seaweed or seaweed seaweed cultivation technology has been established and there is a, there are efforts which are basically being made as far as the land based uh, seaweed culture practices to be carried out in gujarat you will see that there are large number of fisheries amendments and enclosures these are something what are called as protected areas and these protected areas are normally being preferred as far as such seaweed cultivation is concerned because there are several advantages as far as selection of the site is concerned mainly from point of view of seaweed cultivation so if you look at as i said initially that it is the, these are the three important groups of seaweeds which are known to have uh, as far as the economic viability is concerned uh, uh, you will find most of the green alga that is alva or monostroma they are known, known to be of edible seaweeds then you have purpura or nori nori which is being obtained from Japan and from mainly from Japan and other areas, and you also have Grassleria and other brown algal forms, which are known to be uh, having a phycocolloid seaweeds, which have got different applications as far as pharmaceuticals and other applications or biomedical applications are concerned. So these are some of the resources of the seaweeds which have been identified to be economically important as far as the, the global production and also at, and all of these species are also known to be uh, to be. A, available as far as the indian coast is concerned now if you look at the applications of this, this macroalgae apart from food and fish you will find they have got applications in phytoremediation pharmaceuticals and cosmetics nutraceutical uh, energy and fuel hydrocolloids and maybe chemicals and fertilizers i will come to this in slightly more detail uh, with the progression of my talk now if you look at the seaweed potentials uh, another important thing that you have is the development of it can be a raw material for development of top bioplastic secondly from the environmental point of view it can also absorb a substantial amount of wave energy or the or the uh, environmental anomalies or calamities that are known to prevail in the post waters by absorbing that particular uh, energy and thereby it can provide uh, much sustainability to the coast ecosystems as as they are also known to have a natural conservation and will positively also promote the fish population and it can be also an alternate to manure and cattle feed as i already told you and it is also a resource for biofuel and chemicals and it has been estimated that if we if we can uh, cover up at 
is 2% of the world ocean or sea surface. As far as civil cultivation is concerned, we can suffice or we can produce the food for the entire world population. So this is the potential as far as the civil cultivation that is going to be there. And it has been also as, uh, uh, demonstrated that an area of about 0.2 hectares uh, within a period of about 45 days can create 100 tons of, can grow about 100 tons of seaweed as far as the seaweed production is concerned. Now here you can see some of the other uh, applications as far as potentials of seaweeds are concerned. They have got anti-cancer, they have produced large number of antioxidants, the stress protection, then you have UV protection, a uh, large number of pigments and a variety of products like coilants, agar, carangenin, alginate. These are probably known agaros, which we have applications in the ice cream industry and large number of other industries. And they are also known to boost the immune system as far as human health is concerned. Now, um, I, I, I'll slowly go into this, that is food and feed, if you look at, we have raft culture technique, we have a rope culture technique, and in, if you visit some of the Asian, Southeast Asian countries, you will find the seaweed salad that is really being served in the, as a dish, and can be also used as far as the cattle feed is concerned. And in fact, some of the, some, in some of the countries, they use the sea, sea, seaweed powder as an ingredient to enhance the nutritive value of a particular product. And it has been also indicated by FAO in a recent review paper that wherever you are likely to use this algae in terms of opposite fish culture, as far as aquaculture practices are concerned, at a small scale or maybe at a pond level, it is definitely going. To, it is definitely going to improve the water quality as well as the production. I will cite an example of this in a, in very soon. They are also known to be an excellent probiotics mainly the seaweed, uh, brown seaweeds, which are normally known to have these short chain fatty acids. And these short chain fatty acids are known to stimulate absorption of sodium and water and are known to modulate the immune system. Secondly, it has also got a, a property or a pathway which mainly operates mainly through this acetate to pionate desiderate, which supplies a sufficient amount of energy to the epithelial cells in the, in the large intestine and thereby controlling the gut flora, which ultimately helps Improving the digestibility of the human population. Now, most of you must have heard about the phytovolatization as far as the terrestrial plant communities are concerned, where in the sediments or in a particular area, if there are contaminated sediments, you can use such type of technique to get rid of this particular component, uh, contaminants uh, from the sediments. The, from the, from the root system is not really known to absorb this, uh, this contaminants, and through the talus, you will find that it is basically being transported to the surface or to the to the leaf portion where the some of the volatile compounds or some of these contaminants which are volatile they are being subjected to higher atmospheric temperature and as a result you find they are lost back into the environment because i have i have, I have limited knowledge as far as the land plants or a plant community is concerned but on the contrary in the aquatic ecosystem if you look at in the, in the aquaculture ponds uh, in Tanzania, they have demonstrated this, where they have cultured this lithopinous phenomenon. It's a shrimp which is cultured uh, in, uh, in association with grasslaria. And this grasslaria, whenever it is known to be grown in this, in this species, as far as the aquaculture systems are concerned, is known to generate a substantial amount of uh, biomass, mainly through assimilation of nitrogen. And this amount of nitrogen which is likely to be made available to this particular grasslaria is mainly from the fecal pellets of this particular shims, which discharge a huge amount of ammonia at their fecal pellets. So here, a typical example how in the aquaculture system, uh, you will find the seaweed cultivation along with some of the aquatic uh, uh, higher organisms, maybe, maybe crustaceans or maybe some of the aquatic other aquatic organisms which are probably known to be generating animal protein, they can modulate or regulate the water quality as well as you will find the increase in the production that is going to come from both the, both the resources. They have also an important role to play as far as the metal removal is concerned. You can see and you can, wherever such metal pollution areas are likely to be there, wherever there is a seaweed cultivation which is being carried out, you can find seaweed biomass with high amount of metal content depending upon your requirement. And, and it, will, it will also have an enriched metal concentration in their uh, seaweeds. And other, from the demineralized seaweeds, you can have other, bio, bio, other biological applications like production of byproducts, like bio oil or maybe bioethanol. It has also got a variety of cosmetic applications. Uh, as you know, that most of these microalgae are going to produce, produce 
a variety of polysaccharides, pigments, and protein lipids, and also maybe vitamins and amino acids. Most of these particular products which are being generated or synthesized within the within the within the cells of this particular seaweed population are normally known to have anti-aging property, anti-aging as well as antioxidant property. They act as an excellent moisturizing and hydration agent, collagen boosting. They also provide a photoprotective action and also inhibit the production of melanin. And they are anti-inflammatory, antiviral, and antibacterial properties as far as the seaweeds are concerned. Now, I, I just uh, thought that I will try to go slightly in detail into this, that how does this happen? Now, most of us must be aware, as far as the forum sensing mechanism in the bacterial population is concerned, which is mainly mediated by some of the autoinducers like uh, N-acyl homocysteine electrons. Now, this, uh, the quorum sensing uh, technique in, uh, for, in uh, bacteria or in most of the microbial communities is normally known to be prevailing to sense certain chemical signals so that you find more and more aggregation of this particular bacteria that is known to occur. So, as and when there is an infection, you will find a bacterial colonization that is known to occur, and then you find the infection that is known to be comparatively more and more serious. But most of this uh, seaweeds. They are known to produce an antibiotic exoenzyme, which is called as furanone, which resists the biofilm formation. So, by producing this particular chemical compound, uh, uh, which has been demonstrated in the uh, Helimania and Galicia pulchra, they are known to inhibit this quorum sensing mechanism, thereby not allowing bacterial aggregation or uh, colonization that is likely to, that, that can occur in, when the infections are normally known to prevail. Because of Alva species, it has been also demonstrated that it has. It, it harbors uh, certain uh, bacteria called Sura Ultramonas pivicata, which also has got an ability to produce some of the inhibitory substances which can which can take care of such uh, such uh, cosmetic and uh, cosmetic applications in the human human health. Another important area which also need, uh, not has not developed that much as far as extraction of the pigments from these particular seaweeds. There are different mechanisms or methods that are basically being available as far as extraction of these particular seaweeds are concerned, right from solvents, then we have microwave ultrasound technique, electrical fields, and maybe pasteurized liquids that are normally being used as far as extraction of these particular pigments are concerned. But however, uh, the efficacy of these particular methods in terms of expert, in terms of extraction of these particular pigments are concerned is not very well established, and we do not. It is a, it is a slightly premature stage to. Claim that we will be able to develop or we will be able to identify a particular method as far as pigment extraction is concerned. Most of these pigments also have health benefits like antioxidant properties, anti cancer, anti inflammatory, anti inflammatory, and anti diabetic. Now, one of the most important aspects that has been uh, that needs to focus as far as this particular area is concerned is somehow to generate awareness among the local population or the human community that. There is an increase in the consumption of the whole seafood as a, as a human food. And probably to, to identify and to extract some of the bioactive molecules, such as polysaccharides and protein, which ultimately can benefit the human health. These are some of the examples of, uh, of the pigments, which have been, uh, which are natural dyes, which have been uh, obtained from this marine algae, and which probably can be one of the, one of the important areas to substitute some of the synthetic dyes that are basically being used in the textile industry. Now, as I said, at some point of time, one of the pigment that is being produced by this particular brown alga is fitosanthin as a bioactive compound. Now, this also has got a property to stimulate something what is called as uncoupled protein, and which is, which is normally known to act uh, mainly through thermogenic respiration, that is, uh, uh, there is a mitochondrial brown fat protein. This is known to target and bind harmful fat and a bad cholesterol. The pigment is in the form of fucosanthinol, which also causes uh, liver to produce glucosyacionic acid, which is known to contain about 97% of the omega-3 fatty acids, which improves many aspects of health, right from brain to heart. And, and as I said, this DHA, which is known to produce, it can also take care of bad cholesterol associated with obesity and heart diseases. Another important component which is associated with this is also my, mycosporin amino acid, which is mainly being extracted from porphyra, that is pelletin and pelletinol. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a secondary metabolite which is being produced by this particular seaweeds, that is mainly uh, porphyra, gallidium, and laminaria, and is known to be a photoprotectant. It is also an excellent uh, antioxidant 
and also provides uh, a substantial relief for this particular uh, seaweeds, mainly to reduce the stress mainly generated from salinity or salt or the desiccation and in the temperature stress, mainly in the intraglial ecosystems where we have extreme environmental conditions that are not good. It also, as I said, it also provides UV protection and uh, you will find that these compounds like ammonia acids are basically being derived from some of these seaweeds and they can protect against the cellular damage and photoaging. If you look at this particular spectra, you will find that the topmost spectra that you see, which is indicated as in a black color, is mainly the spectra that is being obtained from seaweeds, which has got a better uh, protection in terms of the UV protection that is being given as compared to some of the synthetic protections that are being available in the market, thereby indicating a huge potential in terms of the UV protection that is going to occur. They also have an application in the hydrocolloids where the long chain polysaccharides and proteins have ability to absorb water. And as they tend to absorb this particular water, they can possibly be used as a thickening agents in the, in the food by where they pop gel like material. And mainly from algae, you will find agar agar and carangina, which have been derived from the seabeds. And they have got applications in bakery and also in production of certain vegetable gums. Look at the nutraceutical properties. You have green alga, red alga, and brown alga producing L1, alternate, and, and agar and carotenoid starch, which have got a nutraceutical properties like they support uh, the nutrition in the form of calcium, potassium, iron, and iodine. And as a result, you will find a variety of products which have come in the market, like green foods or seaweeds, etc. But I would like to make a mention of this caralmin which is a product, uh, which is a anti-hypertensive extract, which has been produced by India uh, at CMFRI, and it is also being marketed in the markets. Apart from this, it has also got uh, anti-cancer potential. Now, in the cell matrix of this particular brown seeds, you find a sulfonated polysaccharide molecule that is called as fucoidon. This fucoidon is normally being subjected to uh, hydrolysis by fucoidin, which is responsible for uh, hydrolysis and which is responsible to have this type of property and is only found in brown seaweeds and some of the marine microbes. Now here, out of box, I would like to also make a mention of marine echinodermates, which is the only exclusive marine phyla, also has got the uh, ability to produce such type of compound that is quite done. And this, uh, this, this is one of the uh, reasons why, why it has been always said that uh, there is a huge potential in terms of uh, extraction of drugs, which probably would help the human mankind in a, in a near future. And this picoidon has got a property of antiviral, neuroprotective, and immune, modulating, immune modulating properties. This anti-cancer uh, property is mainly being mediated by targeting apoptotic cells, mainly through induction of cell cycle arrest. And it also has a programmed uh, death uh, pathway and it also is known to uh, support or uh, upgrade the immune system activation and is also considered to be one of the important therapy uh, which synergizes with the chemotherapy treatment that is being given to the patients. In this context, I would also like to make a mention of Indian plant that is Bisozylum by Nectiferum, which also has the ability to produce flavopyridol, which is known for inhibiting the cell cycle progression, mainly through a cycling dependent kinase. So these are some of the potentials in terms of how it can act as a potential anti-cancer uh, uh, compound in regulating or rather in controlling. So this is how you will find that it will ultimately delay or inhibit the cancer cell proliferation that is known to offer for as uh, the seaweed utilization is concerned. Some of the advantages that you normally see are they are available in abundance, they are inert nature, biocompatible, biodegradable, non toxic, and all these properties. Because of this particular property, also again, the seaweed polysaccharides are also considered to be comparatively of um, better level as compared to other aquatic resources. So now, here, I would like to mention about some of the products that is the health thing. You have a seaweed beer, which is normally being generated, and it has also got some medical applications, which are very, 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 there is a US patent. You have a sap that is known to generate it, that is the liquid fertilizers, which, are, which, which can probably act as a biostimulant for most of the agriculture practices. And you will find that there are other uh, byproducts like bioethanol, gasification, production of biofilm, carangenin, 
pet foods, dairy products, etc. So these are some of the potentials of the seaweeds, which probably could be exploited over a period of time. And in recent future, we may find that this seaweed can be one of the potential raw materials for this of such type of products. And here you can also see there are a large number of PS patents which have been filed for synthesis or propagation of the particular products mainly generated out of the seaweed. So here you can see that uh, marine phytoplankton, collagen, liquid seaweed, and some of the anti, anti, uh, anti um, uh, or, or cosmetic uh, creams which have already come in the market and are being marketed and have got a positive impact as far as the human health is concerned. Now, finally, to conclude, uh, as I said, that uh, this is one of the most promising uh, aquaculture technology or the civil culture technology that has been developed. But we have a large number of challenges as far as open sea civil farming are concerned, because one of the most important things in the tropical ecosystem is the season. And uh, you, have, you find that uh, the natural calamities that are normally known to occur, and unless until uh, if there is a natural calamity, then you find the total production that is likely to be lost. Seed, seed material is another important area because unless and until you have abundant supply of seed and maybe through genetic manipulations or somehow, we, 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 uh, unless and until we are in a position to meet the requirement of the seed, the culture practice cannot go on. And you have different problems like grazing, diseases, despite of all these uh, antiviral and antibacterial properties which are bestowed in this particular seaweeds, you will find they are also known to face a problem of disease, epiphytism and grazing, which is normally known to offer. And this is another important area, which is which is probably a setback as far as seaweed farming or cultivation is concerned. And you can, again, the climate change or the drifting or the loss of the crop, and there is the inconsistency in the yield and uh, the management practices and the labor, etc., are some of the challenging issues which, 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 will, which will emerge over a period of time. And finally, most of these coastal ecosystems, they have got a variety of utilization as far as the availability of the sites are concerned. And there is always a conflict which is normally known to occur with the, with the fishing activities or the local activities that are known to prevail. And uh, probably in, a, in a, another five or in a, another five years, we would see a situation where we will combat or try to overcome all these particular uh, issues and probably CV technology would emerge as one of the one of the major area where it can mitigate the aquaculture production and suffice the requirement of the global population is something. So with this, I would like to thank, uh, express my sincere gratitude and thanks to Dr. Bodhisattva uh, I and all the viewers who are who are who are there on the platform. And I would also like to acknowledge. Uh, all the references and the resource materials that I have used for in, uh, towards the preparation of this particular presentation. And my special thanks to Dr. CRK Reddy, who is a biotech chair at the Department of Biotechnology in New Delhi, uh, who is an authority in the seaweed cultivation technology and who was very supportive of this particular presentation. And he probably advised and uh, a lot of input in order to make this particular presentation, and and my special thanks to him because I have he has also allowed me to use some of these transparencies which were prepared and with the help of which I have I have made this particular presentation. I I hope I have done justice to whatever presentation that I was supposed to give, and I will I will uh, I will request uh, Professor Suhas Gorte to take over, or maybe uh, if in case if there are any Session. We can have a session on the session. Thank you, Professor Rivanta, sir. Rivanta, sir. Yes, I am there. I am listening to you. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. As all of us are aware, plankton are very important component of the ocean. And uh, seaweeds are considered as a gold mine. It can be used for pharmaceuticals. Oh, over and above, it can also be for as a very good genetic resource. Of course, it, it can be used for food, for man as well as animal, nutrients, supplements, and biodiversity, renewable sources, apart from being a very good bioindicator. I, I can understand Dr. Rivankar has taken a very big topic. It is a Herculean task, a such a vast topic to be completed in about 15 minutes. Dr. Rivankar has successfully done it. It is just like putting an elephant in a bottle. I am sure 
Sir will be happy to answer a couple of questions from one of some of our uh, viewers. Uh, may I request the viewers to kindly put on your mic and ask questions or present clear, clarify any doubt with the Professor Yuan Sir. Uh, participants, please. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Bosley has asked one question. Uh, the question is at what extent toxic chemicals 